Christ. Also, turn with me in your copy of God's Word to Matthew chapter 21, and we'll be looking particularly at verses 33 through 46 this morning. Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 through the end of that chapter. And keep your finger there as I share a little bit of introduction before I read the text this morning. The parable of the wicked tenants in the vineyard that we're about to read is a picture of the history of Israel. Within this parable, Jesus will describe the general behavior of Israel toward God in the days of the kings and of the prophets, even all the way up to Jesus' own days, his own life and ministry. And toward the close of the parable, Jesus will even foretell of Israel's malicious rejection of him and his being crucified outside the city at their rebellious hands, which would take place only a few days after these words were spoken. Then Jesus does something which is breaking all the rules of modern communication. He's just given us one extensive metaphor, and then he gives us a second extensive metaphor that is different. Normally you say, well, that's going to get confusing, and I hope it isn't for us today, but what Jesus shows us has a central theme. First, the parable of the tenants, and then the picture of the rejection of the cornerstone. And both of these are are communicating the same overarching truth. And it's a truth that for some may be new to them, something maybe even different than they've heard in times past. And that truth is this, and you'll see it directly from the text. The nation of Israel, God's former covenant people, have utterly rejected their God. And at last, God's judgment against them has come. As a result, Jesus will declare in verse 43 that the kingdom of God will be taken away from the nation of Israel and given to another people. No longer will the nation of Israel be God's people. The unique blessings and privileges which the nation of Israel formerly enjoyed as God's covenant people will be taken away and given to another people who will rightly honor God, particularly by rightly honoring his son, Jesus Christ. If a Jew is to receive the favor and blessing of Abraham, they must now become members of that other people of which Jesus speaks in this passage. Well, who is that people? If not the nation of Israel, then who are God's people now? Beloved, that people of whom our Savior will speak is the global church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The church, not the nation of Israel, now represents the one continuing body of God's covenant people to whom all the rights, privileges, blessings, and promises of God now belong as our birthright and inheritance. The church, which is comprised of believers from every nation, whether Jew or Gentile, is the true Israel of God, the true people of God, and those who actually share the faith of Father Abraham, and therefore are the true inheritors of the blessings of God which were promised to him. Another way to put this is as follows. It is not a person's ethnicity that determines their standing before God in any measure whatsoever, nor has it ever been. Jewishness has never saved, and Jewishness does not save now. As Paul says, no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, that is, physically. He says that in Romans 2. Rather, what determines a person's standing before God is their relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith. Those who are true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ are the true citizens of God's everlasting kingdom. And this is true for Jews and Gentiles alike. There is no distinction. Did you hear my words? There is no distinction. Some of you may be thinking, well, I think there's a distinction. I thought you might. So let me read to you from Romans 10. Paul's words, verses 11 through 13 of Romans 10. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. That is, everyone who believes in Jesus Christ. Verse 12, for there is no distinction, says the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who do what? Call on him, that is, call on Jesus Christ. 
For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Therefore, to reject the Son of God is to reject your place in God's kingdom, period, whether Jew or Gentile. To reject Jesus is to be cut off from the one people of God, whether you are a Jew or a Gentile. It makes no difference. Jesus is the dividing point for the entire world. And the true Israel of God are those who are in Christ. Now, some of you are thinking, boy, that's very different than I've heard or been taught. I fully understand that and have been begging God and asking other pastors I know to beg God for me to be a very helpful teacher for you today. But I want to show you these things now in the Scripture so that you can go to God's Word where the authority dwells. And you can look at the words of Jesus yourself. Look at his teaching and see if these things are not so. Would you stand with me now as I read to us from Matthew chapter 21, verses 33 through the end of the chapter. This is the word of God. Hear another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son, but when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. When, therefore, the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the Scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. And although they were seeking to arrest him, they feared the crowds because they held him to be a prophet. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will endure forever. Please be seated. Let's dive into this elaborate section of Scripture. First, the master who's depicted here in the beginning of this parable of the tenants, the master who plants the vineyard and provides for it, the master is God. And the vineyard is Israel. Even as we read in Isaiah 5, the vineyard of the Lord is Israel. The vineyard is God's covenant people whom he had planted for himself and blessed. Now think about all these measures this tenant took for this vineyard. Notice them in verse 33. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard, and what did he do for that vineyard? He put a fence around it. He dug a wine press in it. He built a tower, and he leased it to tenants. He gave it caretakers to look after it and keep it. He provided very much for this vineyard. He, in fact, you might say he did everything that would be needful for this vineyard to flourish. Well, these various measures which the master took to cause the vineyard to be fruitful and defended and profitable, they refer to the manifold special spiritual privileges which are enjoyed by God's covenant people. What do I mean by that? They refer to the things that were inherently blessed about being born into the covenant community of God's people in the days of old. Being born a Jew in the days of old was no guarantee that you would believe and be saved. But it did mean 
that you were born into the most spiritually privileged position you could possibly be born into. Why is that the case? Because from your infancy, you would be surrounded by all of the ordinary means that God has promised to use to bring the souls of sinners to salvation. You would be under the ministry of the Scriptures. You would be, under the, uh, be able to see the gospel displayed in the sacrifices, to see the gospel portrayed in the feasts. You would hear the convicting truth of the moral law proclaimed. You would even see in your father and your mother a model of godliness. They would pray for you. Being born into a religious family, a Jewish family, came with blessings. It came with privileges. It came with all of the fertilizer, all of the defenses that you needed for the vineyard to flourish. And beloved, the same thing remains true today but not for Jewish people. The same thing remains true today for children who are born to believing parents, children born into a Christian home. And I don't mean a Christian home where Jesus is sort of given a nod and then forgotten about. I mean a Christian home where Christ is actually Lord of that home, where he is honored in that home, where his word is revered in that home. Those children are still born sinners, aren't they? They're not redeemed just because their parents believe, just as Jews were not born redeemed just because they were born Jews. But they are born in a tremendously privileged position. All of the ordinary means that God uses to save sinners surround their lives, the lives of children born into covenant families, in a way that is not true of children who are born into unbelieving homes or in homes where Jesus is named cavalierly but not actually followed. All those blessings of hearing the ministry of the word as the children in this room today are doing, hearing the faithful preaching of God's word, hearing about confessing our sins, seeing their father and their mother open the scriptures day by day to meet with God, praying before meals, they have all these blessings surrounding them. And these things are the kinds of things that are being referred to in the master's provisions for his vineyard. When he put a fence up for it, when he uh, built the tower, he provided in every way for this vineyard to have its needs met so that it should bring forth fruit to his glory. But what about these tenants? Who are these tenants that he hired or leased this vineyard out to? Well, the tenants refer primarily to the spiritual leaders of Israel, who were to make full use of all of those provisions I just mentioned in order to cause the vineyard, which is Israel, to flourish to the master's glory. In other words, these tenants were, let's say, God, one of those blessings is the Bible. Well, what should the tenants do with the Bible? They should teach it to the people. They should explain it to the people. They should be faithful according to what it says. All of those means would be a faithful tenant. It would help the garden flourish. It would cause the vineyard to fulfill its purpose. Are you understanding the picture so far? The, so far, the master is God, the vineyard is Israel, the tenants are the spiritual leaders who were to make that vineyard flourish to God's glory. But something happens in the next verses, doesn't it? You see, instead of causing this vineyard to flourish to God's glory, these wicked tenants took all that belonged to the master and used it to serve their own desires. Do you see it in the text? Look with me at verse 34. When the season for fruit drew near, he, that is the master, sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. Notice the personal pronoun there, the possessive. It's his vineyard. It's his stuff. It's his fruit. It all belongs to him. But what do they do? Look at verse 35. The tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. 36, again, the master sent other servants, more than the first, and they did the same to them. The tenants were to cause this vineyard to flourish to God's glory. Instead, they took all that was God's and turned it in for self-advantage, selfish seeking. The servants whom the master sent here, and these verses refer, those servants the master sent to go gather the fruit, they refer to the prophets whom God sent to proclaim his word to his people. In various ways, these prophets boldly came to God's people as they were sent and proclaimed God's will, 
They proclaimed God's law. They proclaimed God's judgments and promises. They proclaimed God's requirements for his people. In short, you could say that when the prophets came on behalf of the master, they called Israel to repent of their sin and to be faithful to their God. The funny thing about the faithful preaching of God's word, whether by the prophets of old or by pastors today, is that faithfully preaching God's word openly exposes the wickedness of sinners' hearts who are living in rebellion to God. When, when, God, when those prophets came to the people and they spoke the truth, they were speaking it into a world of rebellion, into a vineyard gone awry, into tenants being unfaithful. And when they said what was true, what was right, what the tenants ought to be doing, do you know what that showed about the tenants? It showed that they weren't doing what they should be doing. And such a thing causes certain feelings to arise, doesn't it? Feelings of resentment, feelings of anger, feelings of being exposed. And you know, they're just as then, so it is today. When, when God's word is preached today, when God's truth goes forward, the standard of holiness goes forward, what happens to your heart and mine? It is exposed. It shows that we are not good people. But in fact, we are sinners in need of God's mercy. And there are only two ways to respond to the truth of God's word when it exposes the reality of our sin. There's only two ways. Either repentance or rebellion. Those are the only two options. You say, well, what if I just do nothing? That's rebellion. Because you have not turned to the Lord. Either repentance or rebellion are the only ways to respond to the word of God when it comes and confronts us and exposes us, as the prophets did. But which did these tenants choose, according to our text? They beat them and killed them. They refused to listen. They chose, beloved, the way of rebellion. And this is not only a picture of what the spiritual leaders did, but this is a picture of what the nation as a whole did. They chose the way of rebellion. And notice the progression from verse 35 to 36. Excuse me, 34 to 36. The master sends prophets to them, a number of them, it's plural. He doesn't tell us how many, but he sends a number of prophets to them and they kill all of them. And then what happens the master sends even more prophets to them. It says even more than the first. And what do they do to them? They double down on their rebellion. They, what they did in the rejection of God's word, in the rejection of the master's honor, in the rejection of the glory of God, refusing to submit to him, they did repeatedly and repeatedly and ruthlessly again and again and again. And beloved, this is a description of the history of, of Israel. This is a description given to us by Jesus Christ of the history of Israel's rebellion toward the Lord. God had chosen a people for himself, his vineyard. God had provided them with every blessing, every advantage, every privilege. God had been patient with their sins and failures, sending them prophet after prophet for centuries in order to teach them the truth and to call them to repentance. As, I say, as Isaiah says in one place, all day long I have held out my hands. God is ready to forgive God is ready to meet the needs of his people. He's ready to overlook their offenses. He sends them more and more. But what do they do again and again and again? They killed these prophets. They rejected God's word. They refused to honor the owner of the vineyard. In the logic of every person, I mean, if we're just thinking here, you're the owner of this vineyard. And the logic of every person, now is the time for unmitigated vengeance and wrath against these wretched people who have done great evil and injustice against you and your servants whom you've sent. In the mind of every person, enough is enough. After the first incident, we would have been, that's it, we're done, the people are, oh, I'm taking them out. But God did not do that. Do you see it? 
Look at the mercy shown of God in this parable. He sends the first group of servants and they don't listen to them. They kill them and reject his word. They dishonor the master. He sends even more servants and they kill all of them too. And what does the master do next? In verse 37, finally, he sent his son to them. This is not a good businessman. This is a man who's, in fact, let me put it this way. The only thing in this parable more outrageous than the wickedness of the tenants is the mercy of the master. That's the only thing more outrageous. He sends them his own son. He still will not let the hammer fall on these rebels. He still will plead with them and say, turn from this wickedness you've done and will overlook it. Give me the fruits that are mine. Honor me as you should. Turn to me and all will be well. But they will not listen. What do they do when the sun comes? It says in verse 38, But when the tenants saw the sun, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. You see, the master had reasoned that once they saw his son, once they saw the greatness of his patience toward them, the greatness of his mercy, the greatness of his long-suffering, once they saw that he was willing to send his own son, surely, he thought, then they will wake up and realize that I am a good master. They will repent and turn away from this. But instead, look what they did. They took everything that was the master's and inverted its purpose on themselves. They wanted to kill the son so that they could take what was his and spend it on their own pleasures. Beloved, is there a better biblical definition of man-centered Christianity in all the Bible? When we take God and his gospel and his word and his church and his singing and worship and we make it about us, ourselves, our own pleasures, our own desires. That's exactly what the nation had been doing for centuries. It was not about the master. It was about themselves and what they could get out of the master. And dear ones, the wickedness of these tenants would be absolutely shocking to the ears of those listening. Imagine standing before Jesus and hearing him tell you this parable. You would be outraged. What kind of wretched rebels conduct themselves in such a way? This is injustice beyond measure. And it's at that very moment that Jesus puts the question to his listener. He's done telling the parable. He is already set up. He knows that our hearts are fully aware of the truth of what such wickedness deserves. Jesus doesn't have to tell them the answer. He knows he can merely ask the question and the truth will come out. And so Jesus says in verse 40, When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? What will the master do to such villainous rebels when he comes? What do people like this deserve? And apparently quite unaware that they are about to pronounce their own judgment. The spiritual leaders reply in verse 41 with these words. Read them with me. They said to Jesus, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. 
Beloved, from their own lips they declare that such people deserve to be put to a miserable death and for the privileges that they were given to be given to others who will properly honor the master. And their answer was eerily prophetic. Eerily prophetic. And this brings us now to Jesus' turn in this passage from a picture of Israel's unfaithfulness to the promise or pronouncement of God's coming judgment upon them. In verse 42, Jesus quotes from Psalm 118, verses 22 and 23. And by doing so, he reveals that these spiritual leaders that he has been talking to are the wicked tenants of which he spoke. They are the tenants he just described in the parable. Let me read the verse. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? That's a way of Jesus mocking them, by the way. Because they claimed to be the authority on God's word, and yet they were constantly not understanding God's word, and we're about to see why. Jesus quotes to them from Psalm 118, have you not read in the scriptures, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it, was, and it is marvelous in our eyes. We need to understand something about this picture Jesus just gave us of a cornerstone. The cornerstone is the first and most important stone laid in a building. It is the stone which defines the proper position and place of every other aspect of the structure. You're standing at a job site and you say, well, where do these bricks go? Where does this door go? Where does that window belong? The ultimate answer to that question me is, is it can only be answered by saying, well, where is the cornerstone? Because it is the measurement of that stone that gives all the dimension and shape upon which everything else ultimately is built in relationship. So when Jesus here quotes this passage, who do you think he's referring to when he mentions the cornerstone? Who is this cornerstone that Jesus is referring to? It is himself. Jesus is the cornerstone. He is the person by whom every part of redemptive history must be measured in order, to properly, in order to be properly understood. I want to try to show this to you. And this is no exaggeration. The Christocentricity of the Bible, big word, Christ-centeredness of Scripture, is an absolute essential hermeneutic, another big word, way of studying the Bible. The Bible was not written so that you could grow up and be a Daniel or be a David. That is a moralistic, unchrist-centered way of reading the Scriptures. Does that mean we can't look up to Daniel's example? No, we certainly can and certainly should. But what we are meant to be looking for and understanding in all of redemptive history is how this ultimately relates to and points to the Lord Jesus Christ. Why do I say that? Because Jesus teaches it. Jesus said, as I quoted last week, you search the scriptures thinking that it's in them that you have life, but it is they that point to me. And yet you refuse to come to me and have life. He says the same thing here in this illustration. He is the cornerstone. He is what everything in Scripture must be measured by and understood according to. For example, if you do not measure the Abrahamic covenant by Christ, you will not understand the Abrahamic covenant. If you do not measure the giving of the law at Mount Sinai by Christ, you will not understand the goodness of God's law or properly submit to its ministry for your soul. If you do not measure David's kingship or the land of Canaan or the great flood in the days of Noah according to their relationship to Jesus Christ, you will not properly understand any of these things. Jesus is the cornerstone by which all these, all these things must be measured in order for their proper function and place to be understood. It is not an exaggeration to say that if you do not measure all things by Christ, 
you will never come to a true understanding of the Bible at all. And what have these builders done in Jesus' metaphor? What have they done to the cornerstone? That which gives meaning and definition to everything. What have they done? They have rejected it. The builders who represent the leaders and the people of Israel have rejected the cornerstone. And as a result, all that they build is crooked and out of place. They had become completely disoriented to the true faith of Abraham. They looked to the law like it was a ladder to be climbed so that they could earn their way to God rather than that which should humble them to look for God's mercy in Christ. They looked to the sacrificial system as something for them to perform so that they could get on God's good side rather than looking for the Lamb of God whom He would someday send. The true Lamb, the true sacrifice, the one that it all pointed to. Their eyes were not on Jesus because he had been rejected by them. The cornerstone that made everything made sense had been rejected by these builders. And therefore, their understanding of the law, the covenants, the promises, and their expectations concerning the Messiah were all utterly at odds with God's actual word. And therefore, when the true Son of God came to them, They would soon do to him exactly what the wicked tenants did to the master's son in the parable Jesus just told. They would say, come, this is the heir. Let us kill him and take his inheritance so we can twist all of the blessings we've been given by God, twist them to selfishly serve our own desires. Jesus now gives a concluding statement in verse 43. Therefore, I tell you, says Jesus, after painting this stark picture of the nation of Israel. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. As in the parable above, the murder of the master's son will be the final straw before the master's righteous judgment comes. Jesus announces in this verse that because of their rejection of the Christ, God will take away the unique blessings, privileges, and promises formerly given to the nation of Israel and give them to, quote, a people who will rightly honor God. That may not be what you have been taught, but I would point you not to me, but to Jesus himself. Go and look at his words. And ask if this is not the case. God will send the nation of Israel out of his vineyard. To use the language of Romans 11. He will break them off or cut them off. And instead he will bring others into the vineyard. Again, Romans 11. Graft them in. It's not that he starts a new tree or a new vineyard. It's that he removes the wicked tenants and brings in new tenants. All the blessings, all the privileges, all the rights, all the responsibilities he transfers to a people who will actually honor his name by actually honoring his son, Jesus Christ. This means that the nation of Israel, and key word there is nation, this is a very complex subject because there is a national Israel and there is a spiritual Israel. The nation of Israel is no longer God's covenant people. Jesus says this privilege was taken away from them. God's covenant people are not those who share the bloodline of Abraham. That is, his biological descendants. God's covenant people are those who share the faith of Abraham. That is, his spiritual descendants. We see that taught to us in so many places, but for instance, Galatians chapter 3, verse 7. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. 
Later in that same book, Galatians, he ends by talking about the church saying, and peace be upon the Israel of God. And do you know who he's talking about? He's not talking about the nation. He's not talking about an ethnic group. He's talking about the church who shares the faith of Abraham, the true Israel of God, those who are honoring his son, those whom he has brought into his vineyard, though they didn't deserve to be brought into the vineyard. Those whom he has given blessings and privileges that they would have never had, but God has mercifully brought them in and given them to them as a free gift. The true and continuing Israel of God are all those people who rightly honor God by rightly honoring his son. God's covenant people are now the church of the Lord Jesus Christ which is comprised of believers from every nation, which includes all the Jews who believed. But it also includes all the Gentiles who believed, not as second-class citizens, but as co-heirs with Christ, part of the one continuing people. There's an important point that I wanted to make right now, and I'm not finding it on my notes if you're wondering why I'm standing here. (laughs) I found it. It is to this, quote, people, the church, that the blessings, promises, and privileges of God exclusively belong, exclusively belong, exclusively belong. If you reject Christ, you have nothing in the Lord. It is exclusively to the one continuing people. Now, I want to raise a question which deserves a much longer answer, but I want to at least touch on it. Does this mean, does what I just said mean that God is completely done with the Jews forever? No, I didn't say that. It does not necessarily mean that. That is not a conclusion that is forced by what I have stated. In fact, Romans 11 would seem to indicate, however very mysteriously, if we can all be honest, would seem to indicate that God is not done with the Jews. That in fact, before Christ's return, he will do a great work to bring many of them to himself. But here's what I want to ask you. What would it look like for those Jews to come to the Lord, to turn to him? It would look like them joining the membership of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it would look like. That's what it would mean. It's not us joining Israel. It's the the Israel coming to Christ under his headship with the church, his bride, the one he died for. That's the truth. And so Jesus gives a very sobering metaphor here at the close. Verse 44. The one who falls on this stone, that is, over Jesus, will be broken to pieces. And when this stone falls on anyone, it will crush him. In these words, Jesus is setting forth a very sobering conclusion for us. Jesus is teaching us that he is the definitive person which divides the whole world into two categories, either saved or lost. He is teaching that he is either your cornerstone and therefore the foundation of your irremovable salvation, or he is the crushing stone who in the final judgment will bring his righteous wrath to bear on all the wicked tenants who have refused to honor him. He is either your cornerstone of salvation or your crushing stone of damnation. That's what Jesus is teaching. And I want to elaborate this metaphor with you by providing an illustration that I hope will be helpful. Borrowing from the metaphor of verse 44, think about these words with me. I want you to imagine a stone that is unlike all other stones. It is a stone that is so dense, heavy, and strong compared to other stones that it can only be used in one place in a building, and that is at its foundation. Why? 
Because if this stone is placed anywhere else in that building, let's say you mix it in with other stones to form a wall, its incredible weight and density will bear down so heavily on all those stones around it that it will only serve ultimately to crush and destroy that wall. But on the other hand, if you place this same stone as the preeminent foundation and cornerstone of your structure instead, its same qualities, that is its strength and density, its immense heaviness, will have the very opposite effect. Its strength and density will now add strength to all that is built upon it. With this stone as your foundation, no storms or winds or waves or armies shall ever succeed in toppling the building. So great is the strength of this stone that it makes for an immovable foundation for whatever is built upon it. Beloved, in this way, such a stone will either be your salvation or your damnation depending on how you treat it. If you will honor the stone and place it as the defining foundation of your life, you will be blessed beyond all measure by its strength. But if you will dishonor this stone and refuse to make it your foundation, you will be crushed beyond repair by its immense weight. There is no middle ground. Jesus is either the cornerstone upon which we have life everlasting by the mercies of God, or he himself declares that he will be the crushing stone, whether you are Jew or Gentile. What matters is not your bloodline or ethnicity, the color of your skin, the country of your origin. What matters is how have you related to the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you honoring God by honoring his son? That's the question Jesus is bringing to a head. And the reality is that those who do not honor the son do not honor the father and therefore remain under his wrath. But the opposite is also true. Even if you're here today and you would say, I have lived a absolutely rebellious life. I have turned my back on God in more ways than I could count. I have participated in vile things. Does this text not show you the heart of God? Look again at the master. Look at how inexhaustible was his mercy toward the rebellious. He sent servant after servant after servant. And what I would tell you today is this. The master's mercy is still not fully exhausted. He still holds forth his hand to the world, calling the world to repent and come to him through his son, Jesus Christ. And he promises full forgiveness for all who will heed that call. Let us pray. 